We are tired of theories. Now we need the truth. Please keep in mind that this is not an episode of CSI. This is an intensive, long-term investigation. We know we have two serial killers. Multiple remains were found in different ways over a long period of time. April 1996. Two human legs that apparently had belonged to a woman. So if you go all the way back to Davis Park, Jane Doe, you have four women that were dismembered in a very particular way. We are on Ocean Parkway. The area behind me is a massive crime scene. The big case that started all of this was the disappearance of Shannon. Police say the remains were actually found by their canine unit. Who is this victim and are there more remains? There may be even more bodies out there. So far, four have been found and some of the police say this could be the work of one person. Canine searches, helicopter area searches, we involve the FBI. I, I don't want anybody to think that we have a Jack the Ripper running around Suffolk County with uh, blood dripping from a knife. We do believe that this item was handled by the suspect and did not belong to any of the victims. Shannon dials 911. It's a very compelling, dramatic tape. She was on the phone for 20 minutes. Those tapes are shocking. Why has the department not released those to the media or to the public? So I want to be clear on that because I know there's been a lot of speculation. I will not stop this fight until we find this killer. We're looking at that, that we could have a serial killer. This may be a cold case for some time. It's unreal and I'm just not... We saw a bag with a bone sticking out. A sunny day, April 1996. Two brothers out for a walk on a Fire Island beach stumble upon a bag with a woman's dismembered legs inside. I said to my brother, the doctor, I said, uh, what kind of bone does that look like? And he said, it looks like a thigh bone. And I said, how do you know? He said, open up the other end of the bag. As soon as uh, we opened the bag, saw a red toenail sticking through and opened a little bit more and it was a whole foot. News 12 Long Island was there as Suffolk police responded to the grisly discovery on Blue Point Beach in Davis Park. Within a half hour, there was a couple of police here. We we're looking into missing persons uh, in both Suffolk, Nassau counties and other areas. Uh, at this particular point in time, there doesn't appear to be anyone in, in Suffolk County. The case grew cold. No one knew it then, 24 years ago. But those dismembered legs with the red toenails were the first sign of the existence of the Long Island serial killer. A person who would become known as the Gilgo Beach serial killer. About a year after the Fire Island discovery in June of 1997, a hiker more than 40 miles away found another dismembered woman, this time in a green plastic bin in Hempstead Lake State Park in neighboring Nassau County. Her head and hands had also been severed, and she wore this heart-shaped peach tattoo on her breast. And the bodies of the dismembered women continued to be found. Three years later, in November of 2000, a woman's torso discovered in a wooded area near Halsey Manor Road in Manorville. Three years after that, in July of 2003, a second torso was found a mile away. Saturday's victim had this wing tattoo on her lower right back, and police say the scrape lines were probably left by the killer. Both victims had their hands and head cut off, and there were no signs of struggle on their bodies. Is this a serial killer? We have no evidence that the, these two crimes are linked. This is how things remained for seven more years. Suffolk police not publicly drawing a connection between the four dismembered women. Four separate crime scenes in three different locations, miles apart, Hempstead Lake State Park, Davis Park on Fire Island, and the woods of Manorville. Then December 11, 2010, a stunning development. A Suffolk police officer with his canine blue found a woman's body along Ocean Parkway near Gilgo Beach. The media at first told he was conducting a training exercise. The dog gave me an indication, which means his tail started uh, waving. He uh, started sampling the air. At that point, I saw the skeletal, skeletal remains of a body. Two days later, three more women were found. Their bodies dumped in a similar way along the north side of Ocean Parkway. Police saying today they were dumped separately over the last year and a half. Born out of a vehicle into uh, the uh, foliage, into the area that's off the roadway. 
so that they wouldn't be seen. It was on December 14th, 2010, when we first heard the term serial killer connected to the four bodies that have been found here along Ocean Parkway. We were standing here in Oak Beach at a news conference when I asked then Suffolk Police Commissioner Richard Dormer if he believed one person had murdered all of these women. Do you say there's enough similarities that you're certain the same person murdered these four and dumped them here? Well, look, uh, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that four bodies in this area. Certainly, uh, we're looking at that, that we could have a serial killer. It was at that news conference that we also learned Suffolk police found the bodies not during a training exercise, but while looking for 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert, an upstate New York woman living in Jersey City who vanished in May of 2010 after working as an escort for an Oak Beach man she met on Craigslist. Oak Beach is a gated community, more than a 50 mile drive from Manhattan. It turned out none of the women who would become known as the Gilgo Four were Shannon Gilbert. Police suspected early on they could also be sex workers. Police Commissioner Dormer said at the time, I don't want anybody to think that uh, we have a Jack the Ripper running around Suffolk County with uh, blood dripping from a knife, uh, which might be the impression that some people would get. It's not that type of situation. One month later, Suffolk police officially identified the four women as sex workers who vanished between 2007 and 2010. 25-year-old Maureen Brainard Barnes reported missing from Norwich, Connecticut, July 2007. 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew reported missing from the Bronx, July 2009. 22-year-old Megan Waterman reported missing in Maine, June 2010. And 27-year-old Amber Lynn Costello, last seen in North Babylon, Long Island, September 2010. But still, no sign of Shannon Gilbert and her family, represented by attorney John Ray, kept the pressure on the Suffolk Police Department. The killer still lurks. We're going to find Shannon if it takes me the rest of my lifetime. Time of 2010, I was the chief of detectives of the Suffolk County Police Department. I was reluctant to do this interview. Earlier this year, Dominic Verone, who is now retired, agreed to speak with me in this rare one-on-one -on -one interview about the Gilgo Beach serial killer investigation that he oversaw. What were your thoughts when, okay, so one body was found and you realized it wasn't Shannon Gilbert? Surprise shock, surprise, we were all convinced that this was Shannon Gilbert. I do know uh, that we did an exhaustive search uh, for Shannon, a whole year, canine searches, uh, helicopter aerial searches, we involved the FBI. At one point, almost the entire team of investigators uh, flew up from the Behavioral Analysis Unit uh, in Quantico, Virginia. Gilbert was finally found in December 2011, a full year after the Gilgo Four. During the search for Gilbert, a total of 10 sets of other human remains were found along Ocean Parkway, including the body of an Asian male and a female toddler. The area in and around Gilgo Beach has been used to discard human remains for some period of time. DNA then linked some of the newly discovered body parts back to the four dismembered women from the late 90s and early 2000s. A skull found in Nassau, part of the woman whose legs were found on Fire Island. Arms with gold jewelry, part of the woman with a peach tattoo. The toddler determined to be her child. And finally, a head and hands linked to the two Manorville torsos. A lot of questions still remain as to how many serial killers that do we have. And certainly that cluster, that close group, we know that was one serial killer. It becomes more controversy when, when you look at the male that was found nearby and killed in another manner. In almost all of these cases, these victims were dead before it was even reported to the police that they were missing. Shannon was an exception. So what did happen to Shannon Gilbert the last night she was seen alive in May 2010? A man named Michael Pack had driven her to the Oak Beach home of the man who hired her, Joseph Brewer. 
but are likely Gilbert's final moments were captured on an almost 20 minute frantic 911 recording as she ran from Brewer's home. It was initially for a two hour session. They extended it to a four hour session. Sometime in that, in that morning, things were not going well. Uh, Brewer wanted her out of the house, woke up Michael Pack. While this is going on, Shannon dials 911. We believe she then stumbles down the stairs and, and runs. And she didn't know where she was. Uh, she sounded disoriented. Neighbors told us she started knocking on their doors. Was she running for that house because she was afraid of something? She was afraid of someone. She looks at him like she's in a trance and then she runs off. Barone says Michael Pack knew police were on the way and drove off without Gilbert. That's critical. They are not aware of that 18 minute phone call that the state police have. They search the area. Michael Pack, no vehicle is, is found. Had Michael Pack stayed there, and perhaps Shannon Gilbert could have been found and located. Gilbert's autopsy was inconclusive. Over the next few years, there was debate over whether Gilbert was killed or drowned in the marsh, as suggested by Police Commissioner Dormer. But after 2011, Suffolk police refused to publicly discuss the case. Barone was out as the chief of detectives when James Burke became the new police chief. Immediately after we were pushed out at the end of 2011, they kind of put a cloak of secrecy over the whole thing, which I think was not good. It inhibits public assistance. And that cloak of secrecy surrounding the case lasted until now. 2020 saw the biggest developments yet in this investigation. Why are you speaking with us now? We should really be relying on the public. Um, the thought is somebody out there knows something. Mr. Brewer, it's News 12. Can we talk to you? Dr. Hackett is right at the center of it all. James Burke and Dr. Peter Hackett were in connection with each other. 48-year-old John Bitroloff of Manorville was arraigned today, charged with murdering two women. Suffolk District Attorney Tom Spoda says there could be more victims out there. It's been nearly a decade of suspicion around the Gilgo Beach unsolved murders. There was also secrecy about the case under Suffolk Police Chief James Burke. His refusal to work with the FBI leading to cries of a cover-up. He could pretty much do whatever he wanted with regard to that investigation. In the fall of 2015, there was one public news conference when Tim Sini became the new police commissioner. Bringing the FBI to the table with all of its expertise and resources is a step in the right direction. But then nothing publicly until January of 2020. The current police commissioner, Geraldine Hart, releasing never seen before evidence, a belt found at one of the original crime scenes. We do believe that this item was handled by the suspect and did not belong to any of the victims. Police also sent DNA from the still unidentified victims to the FBI for familial DNA and genetic genealogy techniques not approved at the time by the New York State crime labs. If they're identified and they their lives then ha can be traced and we can see perhaps a history, a connection between one and another and another. Then in May, the biggest development yet in this case, the woman known as Manorville Jane Doe had been ID'd 20 years after her torso was found. Valerie Mack, who was 24 years old in 2000 when she went missing, she was working as an escort in Philadelphia. Family members last saw her in the spring or summer of 2000 in the area of Port Republic, New Jersey. She was never reported missing. That really was a boost to the investigation. Um, it definitely gave us new leads to follow and a new timeline to establish. Commissioner Hart recently sat down with me for a one-on-one -on -one interview about the unsolved serial killings. I was given an hour of her time, the most access I've ever been granted to a top police official on this case in the 17 years that I've been covering it. Why are you speaking about this now? The decision was made. This is really kind of a different stage we should enter now. We should really be relying on the public. Hart has a unique perspective on the investigation. When the Gilgo Four were found, she was with the FBI. 
She told me without hesitation, the FBI was blocked from the case from 2012 to late 2015. There was definitely an intentional decision made by both the, uh, the district attorney at the time, Tom Spoda, and the uh, administration that included Jim Burke to, um, to keep the FBI out of the, the kind of the heart of the investigation. Why was the decision made, do you know, to keep the FBI out of the investigation? It's really, it's hard to know. Um, you know, my viewpoint uh, is that any investigation benefits from uh, having as many people at the table. Police Chief James Burke was arrested by the FBI in December of 2015 and pled guilty to beating a suspect in an unrelated case. Former Suffolk District Attorney Tom Spoda later convicted at federal trial for covering up for Burke in that case. And at that trial, jurors also heard testimony that Spoda promoted Burke over the years, despite knowing he had been caught having sex with a prostitute in his police car. Today, Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke finds himself on the opposite end of the very laws he was sworn to uphold. Burke has never been named a suspect by the Suffolk Police Department in the Gilgo killings. Neither has John Bitroff, Joseph Brewer, or Dr. Peter Hackett. Although Gilbert's family attorney, John Ray, believes Hackett is responsible. Hackett was thrown into the spotlight when he called Shannon's mother days after she vanished. Mary Gilbert told reporters Hackett said he ran a home for wayward girls. And Hackett initially denied calling Mary to News 12. I didn't make, I, I made, I returned some calls. I never saw Shannon Gilbert. Phone records later proved otherwise. Hackett is still facing a civil lawsuit by Gilbert's estate. Here's what Hackett's attorney says about it now. Dr. Hackett, when we spoke to him, he denied calling Mary Gilbert. Why did he do that? Dr. Hackett, first of all, got confused at one point between the deceased and the mother. And he did speak to the mother. He never spoke to the deceased. And he was concerned about the mother saying, listen, there's a report about uh, uh, that she's missing and she was acting rather irrationally that night. What do you say to those ongoing accusations? They're, they're despicable. Mr. Hackett, Dr. Hackett has never killed anyone and there is no evidence linking him to the death of this, of this poor girl. As part of his civil suit, attorney John Ray fought the Suffolk Police Department in court and won, receiving a copy of the 911 recordings from Gilbert's last known night alive. A judge has barred him from speaking specifically about what's on the tape. He has demanded, though, that police release it to the media. Those tapes are shocking. Why has the department not released those to the media or to the public? Right, so I want to be clear on that because I know there's been a lot of speculation that's uh, come up around this. We are prohibited by law from releasing 911 tapes to the public. Uh, so that's not anything that's ambiguous. But would those 911 tapes make a difference? Investigators have already heard them, including Dominic Barone, who, as I told you, was chief of detectives and in charge of the case in 2010 and 2011. It's a very compelling, dramatic tape, and it will certainly fan the flames that uh, Shannon uh, was was murdered. I strongly believe, based on the background sounds and, and listening to that tape over and over again, uh, that she was just irrational. And she was just in an irrational, emotional state. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, that someone was trying to kill her. It cannot be ruled out. Her death was ruled by the medical examiner to be undetermined. So, uh, therefore, we're open to the idea that it, it could have been a murder. We're open to the idea that it could have been accidental. The bottom line, Will this case ever be solved? Is there a suspect? So, no, we do not have a suspect now, but I do not comment uh, on whether somebody was or somebody wasn't a suspect, so uh, that's something I would go into. But we certainly do not have anybody that we're looking to arrest anytime in the immediate future. Can you say that the department obviously has investigated numerous people over the years certainly. and run down those leads? Certainly, and that's an ongoing process. This may be a cold case for some time. No suspects, no arrests, and as time ticks away, memories fade. It's something that we hope is resolved at some point in some time. So what's next? 
So far, Suffolk police have put out a total of four photos of a belt they believe was touched by the killer. We have received, uh, you know, a number of um, a number of tips on that. So, and we tracked them all down, traced them all down. There are still four unidentified victims with DNA that may be too degraded to be useful. Commissioner Hart says the public is key to solving these murders. We need to give them information. The hope is that something triggers uh, inside them. A majority of the victims were lured to Long Island and killed during the summer months. Look at the times that the people were last seen and when they were, when they were murdered. And think of uh, any people in, in their lives, uh, husbands, boyfriends, or relatives, or somebody that may have had the opportunity or the means. But deliver us from evil. Amen. You think about just, you know, human nature. Something, you know, might strike you as odd. Do you think that the killer or killers could still be alive and living on Long Island? We certainly don't have any reason to believe that now. You know, and the thought is, you know, is this individual dead? Is, is this individual incarcerated? There's no reason to believe that they're continuing to kill people uh, in this area. Will this case ever be solved? So I can tell you that we are committed to continuing uh, to do everything that we can to make sure that we bring justice to the families uh, of these victims. It's almost generational now because these women, some of them had children and they're, they're teenagers now and, and suffering kind of thinking what happened to their mother and I can't imagine that kind of that kind of pain not to know what happened to your mother must be torture perhaps the killer himself could come forth maybe it's about time he do that